was going to say it's about your first time in British Columbia, but that's uh, not entirely true, because I've uh, hit some of your ports back in my Coast Guard days. Uh, and that was a very long time ago, uh, back in 92, so you do the math on that. Uh, okay, so let's uh, talk about what I've done in the past 30 years since then. But um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different than what's in the program, uh, but what's in the program does connect, so you'll see how it, how it all ties in. Uh, I want to talk about imagining the study of Jesus without religion, meaning uh, the idea of what if there was no big faith tradition, what if there weren't millions of people who really had faith belief in this guy, what if this was just a, like a random pagan demigod just like any other, like, like Hercules or Athos or uh, Osiris or any of these other gods. How would the study of religion, uh, study of Jesus look like in that case? What, what would be different about it? Now, uh, hmm. Too far. Uh, the, the, the basis of this is my book that's out now, which, uh, which they are selling some copies of, uh, Proving History, uh, which is Bayes' Theorem and the Quest for the Historical Jesus. Um, and you might wonder what is the connection between uh, Bayes' Theorem, which is a mathematical theorem, and the study of Jesus, much less history in general. And that's, this talk is going to be a little bit about that as well. Uh, but essentially in this book, I, have, I break it down into the problem why this is a problem, why the study of Jesus is, is, has, a, uh, has a big problem in terms of its methodology. Uh, but then in chapter two, I go over the basics of what historians do. Like, what do you need to do to be doing history at a professional level? What is the epistemology of it? What are the basic axioms of it? Uh, so if you're interested in the philosophy of history and the method of history, this is the book on that. And then I explain Bayes' theorem in terms that the humanities uh, majors will not get too terrified of. Uh, specifically for, it's written for historians, so. Uh, and then I show how all historical methods reduce to it, uh, and then I apply this to the methods uh, that are used in Jesus studies, and then I throw in all the hard stuff at the last chapter so you won't be scared off. By the, by the time you've gotten there, you can either decide to read the last chapter or not. <laughs> now, uh, the problem, what is the problem? Uh, the main problem is that the methodology in Jesus studies right now is based on a set of criteria, and every historian who has examined these criteria and written uh, an analysis of them has concluded that they're, they don't work. They're, they're either logically invalid or they're not factually applied correctly. Uh, one of the, the typical statements that you hear is there are no reliable criteria for separating authentic from inauthentic Jesus tradition, for example. Or our criteria have not led to any uniformity of result or any more uniformity than would have been the case had we never heard of them. That's a pretty damning analysis. <laughs> Uh, here's another. The vast variety of interpretations of the historical Jesus that the current quest, using this criteria, has proposed is bewildering. So there's bazillions of these things. And what had been perceived to be a developing consensus in the 1980s has collapsed into a chaos of opinions. Uh, if anything, the professional field should be drawing towards a, a, a stronger and wider consensus rather than getting more and more chaotic and, and disagreeing on things even more. Uh, my favorite analysis of all of this is from Hector Avalos. Uh, scholars on both sides, liberal and conservative, usually construct portraits of Jesus that mirror themselves in terms of theology, politics, and ethical values. The fact that neither side has produced any verifiable knowledge about Jesus forms yet another argument to end biblical studies as we know it. <laughs> Yeah, but only as we know it. We can still do a little bit of ethical studies. We can do it just like we do the study of ancient religions that aren't uh, still practiced religions. Uh, but to get to jump back now to the idea of methods. So okay, so the methods are totally screwed. What do, so what do we replace them with? Uh, and one of the key things in doing this is to look at the logic of history. What is the logical structure of historical argument? How do you get a logically valid conclusion from premises in history? Uh, and it's, you can start from the basic idea of logic in general. Fallacious arguments are common, yet destroy any claim to reliable conclusions, for example. That basic statement applies to all fields. It also applies to history. So historians ought to be studying logic just like anyone else should. And, but to do that, you have to know what fallacies are in order to detect and avoid them. So you actually have to take logic seriously. And the most fundamental fallacy is the formal fallacy, which is violating the basic logical form required to derive a conclusion from the premises you have. Uh, now this book that I have up here by uh, David Hackett Fisher called Historian's Fallacies Toward a Logic of Historical Thought uh, is a great book. He, he concludes by saying, I'm not sure, I, he, he has this entire book where he documents fallacies after fallacies after fallacies, all these bad arguments in published peer-reviewed history. And it's, like, it's a big sized book, and it's really funny too because there's all kinds of really hilarious examples. Uh, but they're serious and real examples. 
But he comes to the end and he says, I'm not really sure. There must be some logic in history. I don't know what it is. Well, I think I do. Uh, and that's my addition to this. What is the logical formula for deriving true conclusions about history? And of course, you also have to have your facts right and your background knowledge right as well. But uh, the form is the first place we got to start. So what is that? Well, th let's talk about what history is. All historical argument is probabilistic. I mean, all your premises, in whatever argument you're making in history, all your premises consist of statements of probability. Whether you're overtly stating them that way or covertly doing it, uh, they're all probabilistic statements. And hypotheses in history about what happened in history and why, they assert what most likely happened in the past and what is the most likely explanation why it happened. And so this is what historians are doing. This is the, the kinds of questions we're trying to answer in history which means that all historical argument pertains to how probable a hypothesis is relative to all of their competing hypotheses, given all we know in general and given the evidence we have. And so that, you can see, you probably all agree that that is an accurate statement of what historians are trying to do, what it is to do history. But when you break this down, you take this English and translate it into the language of mathematics, what you find out is we're looking at a conjunction of conditional probabilities. This is what a mathematician would say. And when you break it down, you look at it, what you end up with is what the, this what describes this mathematically is Bayes' theorem. It's based on the idea, Bayes' theorem is based on the idea of comparing competing hypotheses based on the likelihood of the evidence conditional on background knowledge. And that's basically just the mathematical version of the plain English below. Now, the Bayes' theorem, which I'll introduce you to in a moment, is, I find, the correct mathematical model of all sound historical reasoning. And you should think of it as a logic. Uh, it happens to be mathematical because probabilities are mathematical. But in reality, it's, it's a way of thinking. It's a conceptual idea of how you balance evidence. And this is true. The Bayes' theorem is the, the correct model of all sound empirical reasoning, uh, historical reasoning, whether you're aware of it or not. So even if you do not have any idea what Bayes' theorem is, whenever you make a correct argument in history, it's Bayesian. And I can always point out to you in what ways it is. And that's also whether you use it or not, whether you use Bayes' theorem or not. Even ordinary, as you pick up any history book, if it's got good arguments in it, uh, those arguments are ultimately Bayesian arguments. However, the more aware of it you are, and the more you use it correctly, the more reliable your historical reasoning will be, because you'll know what the correct form is for historical argument, and then you can find out when you're breaking that form, when you're going against that form, mm -hmm. or when someone you're arguing against is. Also, all sound methods reduce to it, and this is something I prove in the book. So if you're interested in this, the idea of how all historical methods that are actually used by historians reduce to this Bayes' theorem, uh, my book will give you all the details on that and show it and demonstrate it. Uh, but the basic point that I find in that book is that you can discover, test, and perfect any method, any new method, using Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem exposes the flaws or fallacies in any method, if such there are, or it demonstrates why any method is logically valid, if such it is. And that's the big utility it has in history. Now, if you want to learn more, obviously my book is the place to start. Uh, if you want something that's a little fun and sort of a... a, a even more uh, lay introduction. I have a video, if you just Google Bayes' theorem lust for glory, uh, you'll find my Skepticon talk, which is basically a 40 minute uh, presentation on how to think like a Bayesian. Well, this is the theorem itself. Uh, so if you're wondering uh, what a Bayes' theorem is, now this always terrifies everybody, and I, I love using it like this to scare the hell out of you, yeah. Um, but that's in mathematics. You should think of this like if it's written in Russian, right? If it was written in Russian, it wouldn't scare you so much. You'd say, I could translate this into English. And to sort of translate it into sort of a structured, sort of graphical English translation, that formula simply means this. I knew <laughs> The probability of your theory, H, is equals, the probability of your theory being true equals how typically your theory is true times how likely the evidence is if your theory is true over uh, another a sum of that plus how typically is your theory, your kind of theory false times how likely is the evidence based on other theories other than your own. And so this is essentially what Bayes did. That, that scary mathematical equation is just representing this in mathematical terms. So the first thing in there is how typically is H2? How typically is your explanation? How, how, when you find similar cases to this, the particular scenario you're describing, what usually happens in those cases? And if you see a light in the sky, what usually does the light turn out to be? That kind of uh, background evidence principle. So let's apply this to Jesus. Faith literature, uh, the whole New Testament, Gospels and Epistles and so on, it, it's, it falls into the category genre of faith literature. Now let's look at faith literature in antiquity. Faith literature in antiquity was typically made up. It was typically fake. It was actually normal. 
to give you a, an idea of this that you often don't run into, uh, is that in fact we know there were at least some 40 different Gospels. And there are four of them in the New Testament, but there were about 40 of them. And even the most hardcore fundamentalist Christian will tell you and swear up and down that you know the other 46 are all fake and made up. Yeah, but that's, so if you do the math on that, that's four out of four. Even if you assume four Gospels are true, that's four out of 40, which is a one in 10 chance that any Gospel you pick up is gonna be the truth. So that means we're talking about Gospels were typically made up, that was normal. So if you're gonna look at the four Gospels in the New Testament and say those are the exceptions, those are the ones that are true, uh, you're really working on faith there. <laughs> We also have about six other Acts. Uh, we have the Book of Acts that's in the New Testament, but there's about six others. Uh, once again, they're all fake. Uh, so if they're all fake, why don't we conclude that the one in the New Testament is just as fake? Uh, there are some 30 forged epistles. Several of them are in the New Testament itself. We know that there, there are some of those in there are forgeries. Uh, but in fact, there's tons of other forged Christian epistles. The Christians were forging epistles left and right. It was like a common industry. <laughs> Uh, and one of the one of the classic examples is one of my favorite finds. Uh, I don't know if you know about the find of Nag Hammadi, which is in, in Egypt. Uh, the, these heretics were being oppressed by the, the Orthodox Christians, and, and the heretics stuffed their whole library into a pot and buried it in the desert, and uh, and it was found uh, in the 20th century. And uh, so they dug out all these heretical documents, and, and it's funny that they clearly just swept their desk into the pot, right? So they weren't thinking. Uh, because one of the things that got in there is they were in the middle of inventing the gospel. Uh, and so we actually have it in mid-process. Uh, and what we have is we have two documents. Uh, one is called the Eugnostos, which is this, this dialogue where, or this, this, this speech or whatever where Eugnostos, this sort of guy named Eugnostos, is pontificating on various issues. And then we have this thing called the Wisdom of Jesus Christ. And we look at the wisdom of Jesus Christ, and they're like halfway through uh, basically copying it over. And what they've done is they've taken all the statements of Eugnostos, put them on the words of Jesus, and add a narrative around it. And so you have someone's converting this Eugnostos speech into a made-up resurrection narrative of Jesus and putting these words into the words of Jesus, and being the words of Jesus. So here we're, at, we're fabricating, we're seeing them in the back of fabricating uh, speeches of Jesus and fabricating narrative that's inserted into. Uh, so this is an example of what we're talking about, what's typical in faith literature. And you can look at lots of other things. I mean, it's pretty much well agreed now that Exodus and 1 and 2 Kings and Daniel and Esther and the Maccabean literature and Tobit and Joseph and Asenath and uh, there are other testaments in the lives of the patriarchs. It's all made up. It's all bogus. Uh, it's pretty much agreed. They might have some facts in them, uh, but it's pretty much agreed that, that these things were largely uh, propagandistic narratives, faith literature fabricated to the purpose. So if that's typical, uh, that's something to look at. Another question to ask is, what is myth? If we're going to say, for example, the Gospels are myth specifically, what do we mean by that? Myth is not really a genre. You hear it talked about as if it's a genre, as if we can look at the structure, and genre marker is a particular thing to decide whether it's myth, and that's not the case. Myths can actually be written in all genres, including history and biography. To give you an example, Plutarch, this historian, wrote a, a standard historical biography of Romulus. Romulus never existed. So here we have basically myth being written in the style and genre of historical biography. So myth can appear in all different kinds of genres. What defines myth is that myths use symbol and allegory to communicate values, ideals, and social and cosmic order. Uh, it's a way of looking at it that the, the story itself is like a parable about something else that you want to say. It's not necessarily a representation of what actually happened. And myths communicate by what they borrow and by what they change. And this is important because a lot of times we hear Christians argue that, well, these myths are different than other myths. And so, yeah, that's the point. Uh, when, you, when you create myths, the point of creating a myth, the point of borrowing something from another myth, is to show in what way you disagree with it by changing it up. The markers of a myth. Uh, meaningful emulation of prior myths. Uh, you'll find that a lot. And myths won't necessarily have all these markers, but myths that do have all these markers are very definitely myths. Uh, the second is, historical improbabilities are frequent and central to the story. Not incidental, not digressions, but are central and, and common throughout the story. And that means not just miracles. Uh, oftentimes people focus on miracles, but no, it's any improbabilities. People behaving in ways that people wouldn't behave in a normal, in, in reality, for example. People behaving in odd ways. Strange things keep happening. Weird, you know, really amazing coincidences happen a lot. Uh, when you see these kinds of, uh, these attributes, that are improbable, even if they're not possible, even if we accept that they could naturally occur, they're still improbable. And myths usually have lots of these and are usually central to the story. And finally, uh, one other marker that you can find occasionally is no external corroboration of key characters or events. Now, that doesn't mean all characters or events. You can have a myth with real historical characters in it. Uh, but when you look at certain key figures, if they don't have external corroboration, 
uh, that could be a sign that you're looking at myth. Not a guarantee necessarily, but that's one of the many markers that you can look at. And there are various other things you can do to test and weigh myth and analyze it. I talk about all of these in the book, uh, so I'm not going to go into them. The smell test, uh, the criterion of natural probability, the criterion of vivid narration, and emulation criteria, like how do you tell what is a, a, an older myth is being emulated by a new myth. So these things are uh, all in there and they're all described in there. Uh, but let's look at some, uh, let's look at those markers that I talked about. One of those was historical improbabilities are frequent and central to the story. Let's look at the Gospels. Right off the bat, the Gospels, the disciples abandon their jobs and follow a stranger instantly. I mean, literally, they're just sitting here fishing. This random guy walks up and says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And they drop their nets and go, that's right, let's go. <laughs> that doesn't happen in reality. That's, 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 that's a big marker for myth right there. That's, that's an unrealistic behavior. That's not what would really happen in history. But it looks great as myth. Um, the disciples throughout the Gospels <laughs> come across as dumber than a bag of hammers. Um, one of the, the classic examples of this has been pointed out by Dennis McDonald is that in the Gospel of Mark, for example, Jesus does a miraculous feeding twice. He feeds thousands of people from a few crumbs of bread and, and fish or whatever. Uh, he does this twice. He does this once. It's the most amazing miracle. He feeds thousands of people and his disciples are there and they're amazed. Wow. And then he goes and does it again and, and, and they need to feed the people. And he says, well, how are we going to feed them? Oh, no. And he says, oh, we've only got a few bits of, bits of food. Oh, no. How possibly can we feed them? As if they've completely forgotten what he'd done before. <laughs> and then he does it again and they're, wow, that's amazing. How can he do that? So it's uh, just an example of the, the behavior of the, of the disciples. And that's not the only example. There are others where their behavior just doesn't look like intelligent people. It looks like sort of... Uh, what you call character types, uh, caricatures of people rather than real people. Uh, another example is the Jews needed Judas to identify Jesus. And this is a guy who's preaching publicly in the temples. Everybody knew his face, uh, certainly within the context of the story, regardless of what you think historically. In the context of the story, he's got this massive triumphal em entry. It's like everybody knows who he is, where he is, and how to find him. So there's no reason they would have to pay Judas. Uh, and by the way, what they paid him is not a lot of money, either, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's too great. So these are examples of un improbabilities in the story. Uh, another one is that the Jews hold an illegal trial and execution on a high holy day. It's just almost every aspect of the trial violates uh, Talmudic law uh, and, and violates Mishnaic law that would have been applicable at the time. And it doesn't even make any sense, even if those laws evolved later, it doesn't make any sense within the context of the way rabbis conducted themselves in terms of high holy days and, and trial court law and so on. Uh, so it's a completely, it's a transparent mythical account. And then of course there's the classic, you know, Jesus flies through the air with the devil, he's fed by angels and magical animals, uh, the nativity stories are full of ridiculous things, miracle tales, tales of a lot, uh, Matthew has a horde of undead descending on the city, I mean there's lots of wild stuff in here. So these are, and these are all key elements of the story, and there's a lot of them. So this, this, the Gospels look like myths. Uh, one of the other ones that I find most entertaining is Jesus withers a fig tree for not bearing figs, quote, even though it was not the season for figs. He gets enraged and curses it and it gets withered. Um, now there's two things wrong with this. One is, even if you could magically wither trees, you wouldn't curse a tree that's not bearing fruit when it's not season to bear fruit. That doesn't make any sense. That's an irrational behavior. Even. Now, if someone has mass, massive supernatural powers and it's that irrational, you need to get the hell away from that. <laughs> Let's look at the, uh, the more obvious improbabilities that people can't magically wither trees. Right, full stop. This is, this is a very mythical story. Uh, another one is Jesus clears the temple square. Famous scene, right? He drives out the, the sellers and everybody. People don't realize that the temple was something like 20 to 40 acres of space and would be occupied by hundreds of people and there was an entire battalion of armed soldiers on station specifically to prevent disturbances like this. And yet you don't hear any mention of this in the story. Um, if, if the only way Jesus could have done this is if he had gone in there with an armed force himself and the Gospels conveniently erased it, and there are actually some historians who propose that that, that must have been what happened, because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Or it's just myth. This is like a, a classic example of a mythical tale where it, it's a very improbable event. This wouldn't happen in real life. Uh, and then there's another one. Uh, the Jews know to guard, they know to guard the tomb in the Gospel of Matthew. But they don't know it in Mark, Luke, or John, even though, according to Matthew, the guards are paralyzed by a flying monster from outer space. So this is like one of the most important and amazing stories you could possibly have, and yet the other gospel writers don't know about it and don't include it in their story. That's an example, and, and, and of course there aren't flying monsters from outer space that can magically paralyze you either, so there's a lots, lots of improbabilities going on here. <clears throat> so that's what we're looking at as frequent and key use of improbabilities throughout the text. So that's 
the Gospels really hit that mark, hit that one full on. The other marker of myth that I mentioned is meaningful emulation of prior myths. Now, this is one that uh, is a controversial one because uh, you'll hear good news, there's good information and bad information about this, but I'm going to give you the good information because I've researched the hell out of this. <laughs> now I can sort the wheat from the chaff to borrow Jesus is saying, um, or the mythical Jesus is saying, as I would say. Uh, it's a dying and rising God mything. The idea of a God that dies and comes back to life was common. It was actually a fashionable trend at the time to have religions that had this feature. And it was very distinctive to the Greco-Roman period, right in this Hellenistic era period and time and place. You don't find this trend in China. Uh, ancient China, for example, there's no fad for dying and rising gods. It's very distinctive to the culture. So when you see Christians, or who began as Jews, adopting their own dying and rising god mything right inside the one culture and historical period where there is a fashion for dying and rising gods, that's a clue right there. And these are the ones, you'll hear a lot of other gods that are uh, purported to be dying and rising gods, and, and those are more or less questionable. But these, I can document, were not only absolutely definitely dying and rising gods, but we have evidence that's definitely pre-Christian, so you can't claim that they borrowed the idea from Christians, even, if that, even though that doesn't make any sense anyway. But, uh, so it's Rome, Romulus. Uh, Romulus is a Roman state god. His death and resurrection was celebrated in annual passion plays. So this is a very publicly known religion, a very publicly known idea of a resurrection story. Osiris, Egyptian god, those who were baptized, yes, baptized, into his death and resurrection are saved in the afterlife. That sounds familiar, I'm sure. And even before this, Selmoxis, uh, the Thracian god, uh, his death and resurrection also assures followers of eternal life. So these, these are examples that we can definitely prove are pre-Christian. And if you want more on that, uh, I document the, most of the evidence in this book. My next book will, will cover more, but uh, this is what's out now in Not the Impossible Faith. It has a whole chapter on this. Uh, but I want to give you an example of dispelling some of the false information. Oftentimes we hear Mithras, or Mithra, is one of these dying and rising gods. We actually don't have any evidence of that, and in fact, what evidence we do have suggests that he's not. Uh, he wasn't a dying and rising god. He did something else. He did undergo a passion. Literally, it's the same word. They call it a passion. He underwent a great suffering and struggle through which he acquired power over death, which he can then share with his followers. So there is a similarity there. But it's not, it wasn't him himself dying. What all these gods do have in common, not, not just the ones I named, there are many others as well, they are all savior gods, explicitly. They're called saviors, uh, and they are all worshipped for the purpose of eternal, eternal obtaining eternal life in paradise uh, after one dies. They are all the son of a god. Uh, a few of them are daughters of god. There's a few, there's a few uh, female deities in this category. Uh, but they are all either the son or uh, daughter of god. They're all demigods in that sense. They all undergo a passion. The same word is used repeatedly in all of these religions. Uh, they all obtain victory over death, which they share with their followers, just like I mentioned for Mithras, but all of them do, both Osiris and, and so on. Uh, Romulus is the only one we're not sure we can't establish this element to, but there are many other gods that we can't establish this element to. They all have stories about them set in human history on Earth. In other words, uh, they all have, uh, for example, Plutarch's biography of Romulus. Puts him in history, assumes he's a historical person, tells a whole story about him. And yet none of them ever actually existed. So what we're looking at is this trend, this fashion for these, these demigods, these demi, these uh, you know, savior sons of God uh, that undergo a passion and, and attain victory over death and so on. Uh, they all have stories that put them in history, represent them as historical characters, yet they're all not historical characters. They're, those stories are made up. To give you an example, another example of uh, myth emulation in the Gospels and in the, and in the Christian story, is called the Rank Raglan mythotype. This is a, a couple old historians from long ago found that uh, there were 22 elements to a sort of standard mythotype you know, that it gets repeated over and over and over again amongst many different gods and heroes. Uh, and Jesus scores as high on this as any of the others. And, and I won't go into the whole list, but uh, it's, it's a large list, and the significant score is if you get more than half of them. There's 22, so if you get 12 or more, uh, you're in a special category. You can look at all of the people in history that we can identify who score 12 or higher on this mythotype scale. And this is all of them that we know about, that we've been able to find, 15 in all, if we count Jesus in included. Uh, notice Jesus scores almost to the top. Uh, he's way up there. And yet Osiris, another definitely non-existent person, only scores 14. So Jesus scores way better on this mythotype scale than even Osiris. And if you're interested, uh, Jesus scores 20 when you count the Gospel of Matthew. When you take that out and just score him according to the Gospel of Mark, which is the first and simplest Gospel, he scores the same as Osiris. He comes out to 14. 
Uh, and if you look at every particular hero on this list, they're all mythical people. Uh, we, we can't confirm any one of them as a historical person. Uh, of course, Christians would insist that Joseph, for example, and Mo Joseph and Moses were historical, but most mainstream scholars agree that those are mythical people too. Uh, so what we're looking at is a trend of scoring on this chart to a, you score a certain number on this uh, mythotech scale, and you end up in this category where we find no historical people at all, which means that if Jesus was historical, he's the most exceptional uh, uh, legendized person in human history. <laughs> So based on what I've just gone over, what has typically been the case, based on what we can see has typically been the case, we should be very skeptical. We should be initially, we should initially approach the study of Jesus with the assumption he's probably not historical, and then wait to see if there's enough evidence to contradict that conclusion. Because demigods like this usually never existed as historical people. It's, it's just, that's what's been typically the case in the past. So we need strong evidence to overcome that initially low probability, and Bayes' theorem explains why that's the case. So that brings us to the second part of Bayes' theorem. How likely is the evidence? So let's look at the evidence. Uh, to understand the basic logic of evidence, this is a Bayesian represent representation using weights on a scale. And I've rephrased the, you know the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I've, I've rephrased that in a more broader sense, that weaker claims require stronger evidence. So even if it's not an extraordinary claim, even if it's just a weaker claim, it needs stronger evidence. And you can represent this using weights. So, a weak claim is a claim that has an, an initially low prior probability. So if you're going against what's typical, if your claim goes against what's usually been the case, then you have a low prior and it's stacked against a high prior. And so that, that weight kicks it way down on the not true side of the scale. So if you want to tip the scale back, you need the likelihood of the evidence to be as, higher or high, as high as or higher than the difference. So the probability of the evidence on your theory has to be a lot more, the evidence has to be a lot more likely on your theory than on any competing theory. So in other words, to put it another way, the evidence has to be very improbable on alternative explanations, except yours. Uh, and you can represent this so that the bigger these, the difference in these two blocks on the bottom, the bigger the difference in these two blocks has to be in terms of probability. Bayes' theorem just puts that into an equation. So what constitutes good evidence uh, versus bad evidence? Usually, when historians approach a question like this, they look for these five categories of evidence. Uh, physical historical necessity is, means that history could not have proceeded as it did had the event not occurred. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, if Caesar had not crossed the Rubicon and captured Rome, uh, the entire, his future, his entire subsequent history of the Roman Empire could not have proceeded. So that had to have occurred in some sense. Even if he didn't do it, he must have sent generals to do it. It had to have occurred, otherwise we can't explain history at all. Conversely, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't have to have happened. All you needed to get Christianity started was a belief that Jesus was resurrected. A belief that, that Caesar uh, captured Rome would not have established a Roman Empire. Uh, so physical historical necessity is one of them. Physical evidence, uh, coins, inscriptions, act, you know, actual physical materials we have for, for Alexander the Great and, and Caesar Augustus and so on. We have actual busts carved from life. We have, we have the coins they minted. We have inscriptions they erected. We have lots of physical evidence. Uh, unbiased or counter-biased sources, meaning uh, not religious propaganda, but someone who's neutral or an outsider saying, yeah, I saw this guy. So if we had some uh, a pagan or a Jewish writer saying, you know, writing about in meeting Jesus and, and talking about him and then talking about this Christian movement that arose, that would be a, a somewhat unbiased or counter-biased source. That would be the kind of thing that we look for. Next is a credible critical account, meaning using the valid critical scholarly methods of the time, uh, there are a few historians like that, like Arian is one where he describes his methods, he just, and his method is not entirely perfect, but it's not a bad method, he names his sources and so on. Uh, and then the next thing would be an eyewitness account. Uh, you know, Caesar crossing the Rubicon is a classic example. Caesar wrote a book about it, and we have that book. So as, if, if Jesus had written a book, we wouldn't be here today talking about this. But, uh, so we have eyewitness accounts for that, for example. Now, when we look at Jesus, what do we have on this list? No, no. No, no, and no. We have nothing. Uh, so the five categories of evidence that historians really want when they're trying to establish something existed or someone existed, Jesus doesn't get any of them. He's not even on that list. So let's get down to uh, the next piece of evidence. The earliest documents written about Jesus are the letters of Paul, and only the authentic letters of Paul. Only seven of them are authentic. There's 13 in the New Testament. The others are forgeries. Um, the seven authentic ones that are all clearly written by the same guy and probably written in the 50s AD, so written about 20 years after Jesus is supposed to have lived, 
Uh, that's, our, that's the earliest documentation we have for Jesus. What, the, what does this say about Jesus? What do those letters say about Jesus? Uh, one curious thing is that Paul seems to only know about a revealed Jesus. He never talks about a historical man walking around Galilee, for example. His Jesus is always in outer space communicating to him through revelations. For example, he says here in Galatians, Brothers, the gospel I preached does not come from man, neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And later in that same chapter he says, Jesus Christ was revealed in me. So that's the idea of Jesus that he's talking about. Now notice the exact same language in the underlying Greek is also exactly the same. In 1 Corinthians 15, brothers, the gospel I preached. Remember the same exact line from Galatians, brothers, the gospel I preached, same Greek verbatim. Brothers, the gospel I preached is what I also received, again the same word, that according to the scriptures Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that according to the scriptures he was raised on the third day and that he appeared to Kephos, etc. and various other people and at last he appeared to me as well. Uh, and uh, 1 Corinthians 11, where he talks about uh, the, the Eucharist ritual and the blessing of the bread and the cup, Paul says the information he gets there is, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night he was handed over, the Lord took bread, and so on. Uh, so again, he's using the exact same word, received from the Lord, meaning revelation. This is, this is the clue we get from Galatians. Uh, that, that's the language he uses for talking about the revelations from the Lord. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Now notice in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is not said to have appeared before his death. Look at that again. It says, according to the scriptures, he did all these other things and died and was buried and so on. And then he appeared to people and lists the people he appeared to. There's no mention of a ministry here. There's no mention of Jesus appearing to anyone before this. Event. And uh, another aspect of the Greek is this, according to the scriptures, often the Bible translations will render this as in fulfillment of the scriptures, but the, the Greek can also mean, in fact, usually means, according to, uh, means we are told by. If you say, uh, according to such and such, you'd say, according to Josephus, this happened. According to the scriptures, this happened. It's the exact same Greek phrase that's used for that. So it looks like what Paul is saying here is that the scriptures tell us that Christ died, Christ died, was buried, and all of this, and then he appeared to these people. So it's important to look at the language, the way it's structured, is not supporting the existence of a historical man, but some sort of revealed being. Oops. Oops. Obey me. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so again, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. <laughs> Paul is talking about what we would call hallucination. He hallucinated his, this vision of the Last Supper and it communicates it to his fellows and thus received teachings from the dead Jesus, which is the celestial Jesus. Um, Paul also has con whole conversations with Jesus. There's other chapters in the letters where he actually had, talks about having one-on-one, -on -one, back and forth conversations with Jesus. So obviously, uh, this guy was having hallucinations of the most potent kind. <laughs> or of course, he's a preacher who's lying. Man. Some people are that as well. Um, so according to Paul, when you look through all of this, is just a sampling of this stuff, but according to everything, when you look all through, scripture and revelation throughout the epistles are the only sources of information Paul ever mentions anyone having. He never mentions talking to witnesses and those witnesses telling him information about Jesus, for example. The Jesus he knows and refers to and speaks to is always in outer space. That's, he's always talking about an outer space Jesus, the Jesus who's up in the sky. And Paul never clearly places Jesus on earth or connects him to human history. There are places where you could try to twist the text to make it seem like he's saying that, but it is no clear case where he's saying that. Now I want to point this out because we have a lot of other trends. We have other examples of religions that began by revelation. Paul says that the, the Christian religion began with revelations of Jesus. So, and in fact, the gospel was first learned that way, not from a ministry before he died. It was, the gospel was communicated after Jesus' death through a revelation. And we have examples of these revealed celestial beings uh, starting religions. Uh, Islam, for example. Muhammad hallucinates conversations. I say hallucinates in quotes because that's what we would call it if we're terrible. Possibly he's pretending to have hallucinated but that's a whole other debate. We can't get into, we can't get into a TARDIS and go back and find out which it was. But, um, <laughs> so let's, let's just go with hallucinates. Now, Muhammad hallucinates conversations with the angel Gabriel, and the Quran records the spoken teachings of Gabriel. Not a lot of people realize that. The, the Quran is not the words of Muhammad. The Quran are the words of Gabriel communicated to Muhammad uh, through this vision. Mormonism, uh, more recently, more famously, Joseph Smith hallucinates conversations with the angel Moroni and see words on magical plates. And the Book of Mormon records what the latter two said. So here we have revealed beings communicating long complex sayings 
uh, to the actual founders of the religion. And those revealed beings are not historical people. There is no Gabriel, there is no Gabriel, there is no Moroni. Um, and when we look at the epistles of Paul, it looks like Jesus is in the exact same category, that Jesus is like Gabriel and Moroni. Uh, that he's the one who, he's the celestial being that reveals the doctrines to the leader. So that the founders of Christianity are actually Paul and Peter, for example. The, the first apostles are actually the real founders and creators of the Christian religion. So Peter and Paul are analogous to Muhammad and Joseph Smith. So, the question is, how likely is all of that? Uh, doesn't seem very likely on the theory that there was a historical Jesus. But there are some passages that people say challenge what I've just suggested. So let's quickly go through those. One is that Lord's Supper passage. People say, well, yeah, he's talking about Jesus at the Last Supper and so on. And Paul never calls it the Last Supper, by the way, uh, which is key, because the Last Supper implies a historical narrative where you've been eating a lot of dinners and you have the last one. Uh, Paul never actually talks about it being a Last Supper. But Paul specifically says that what he records there, he says he received it from the Lord. In other words, just like he received the Gospel uh, in a vision. Uh, there's a passage where it says the rulers of this age crucified Jesus. Uh, the problem with that is that rulers of this age is known Christian code for demons, uh, demons of the air specifically. If you look at Ephesians 2, verse 2, or Ephesians 6, verse 12, we have clear examples of this kind of terminology. There are other reasons why that passage doesn't make sense as a reference to uh, a historical crucifixion. Uh, they're more esoteric. They have to and have to go on a lot of backstory to explain it. But the point being is that rulers of this age does not necessarily mean actual historical uh, authorities. And then the, there's a passage where the Jews are said to have killed him. Uh, this is 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 15 to 16. Uh, that's often cited, but that passage is an interpolation. The uh, evidence for this is extremely convincing, uh, that some Christian added it to the text afterwards. If you want to explore the reasons and evidence for coming to that conclusion, and I'm not, I'm not, this isn't a maverick conclusion of mine, this is many scholars have come to this conclusion. Uh, just Google Richard Carrier and the quotation Pauline on interpretations, uh, and you'll get my blog on that. Uh, then there's a passage where it says that Jesus confessed before Pontius Pilate in 1 Timothy 6, verse 13. But remember when I mentioned that there's forgeries? Uh, this is one of them. This is a forged letter. We can't use a forged letter as evidence for historicity. <laughs> Uh, does Paul mention the earthly family of Jesus, as sometimes is claimed? Uh, he does talk about brothers of the Lord. Uh, however, does that mean biological or adoptive? You can actually be shown that all baptized Christians were considered brothers of the Lord. So when you use that phrase, what does Paul actually mean? A biological brother or this sort of adoptive, mystical brother? Uh, we don't know. We can't tell from the text as it is. Uh, it's often said that he's born of the sperm of David and born of a woman. Uh, curious thing, though, the word is actually the, the word is the word for made, not born. Uh, and in fact, this bothered Christians so much that we have many later manuscripts where Christians tried to erase the word made and replaced it with the word born um, in both of these passages, by the way. Uh, so even they were aware that the word was a little iffy in terms of what exactly it meant. So the question with uh, being made of the sperm of David, does that mean it could mean metaphysically, uh, for example, directly? In 2 Samuel 7, God says that he's going to promise to take the sperm directly from the womb of, take, directly from the belly of David and create a savior out of it. Uh, and you can look at the context to try and fit that, that prediction with the actual events of history. The most likely way to make it fit is to suggest that God held that sperm in heaven like in a cosmic sperm bank and used it to make Jesus in the future. Uh, <laughs> And there's a good argument to be made for this, but the point is, is it can be explained either way. So this is not a, a kind of smoking gun for a historical Jesus. And the other passage is born or slash made of a woman. Uh, that's clearly allegorically. If you look in the passage, Paul is saying that we are also born of that same woman. Uh, and it, it's an allegorical woman, not an actual woman. Uh, so here, are the, this is weak evidence. This is the best evidence they have to throw for, in favor of Jesus, and yet you can see how weak it is. Uh, and, you know, the Gospels, they come, the Gospels are the only ones that do this and put hit Jesus clearly in history, the first to do this. The Gospels come decades after the fact and are the first we hear of an earthly story of Jesus. They're wildly fictitious in their content and structure. I've shown you just a few examples already. Every story in it, in the Gospels, has discernible allegorical or propagandistic intent. And the first of them, the Gospel of Mark, looks like an extended meta-parable. Outsiders are told one story, while insiders are told what it really means. Uh, and then it, the mark even has Jesus, puts on Jesus' lips a statement exactly to this effect, that he's going to teach the apostles in secret the truth and tell everyone else things in parables to try and confuse them. And if you want to know more about this concept of the Gospels as parable, 
the very best book, a very good book, is The Power of Parable by John Dominic Crossan. Uh, it goes into in great detail. His whole thesis is that that's all the Gospels are, are big extended parables about Jesus. Uh, and he makes a persuasive case. Uh, and then these other books as well, Gospel Fictions by Randall Helms is a beautiful short little book that will convince you of how much myth making is going on. And Does the New Testament Imitate Homer uh, by Dennis MacDonald shows this for the Book of Acts, which is the last place we thought you could find such evidence, but he finds convincing evidence and it's done there as well. And there's no other evidence. Everything else is either not independent, meaning it just echoes the Gospels or what Christians said the Gospels said or information that came from the Gospels indirectly in one way or another. And if it's not independent, it can't corroborate. It's useless information. Or it's fabricated, and we have tons of fabricated uh, evidence. The infancy Gospels, for example, in which Jesus is this evil omen-like uh, character who does horrible things to people um, as, a, as a child and a baby. Uh, and this is supposed to be like reverential faith literature. I'm not quite sure I get the joke. but. Um, Completely made up, obviously, uh, entirely fabricated. Je they even fabricated the letter that Jesus supposedly wrote to King Ag Abgar. Um, so, and, and Eusebius, the historian in the fourth century, quotes this letter, you know, sort of proudly, like, "Look, Jesus was corresponding with kings." Conveniently, no one had ever heard of this letter before then, of course. Uh, and then there's the forged epistles in the New Testament and all those other fake documents I talked about earlier. So, remember that last marker of myth: no external corroboration of key characters or events. That's, that's Jesus. So what if we treated the evidence the same as we do for other demigods? We would treat it the way I just treated it just now. Uh, historians, those criteria, remember those criteria I was talking about that the other historians have found are, are bogus, that don't work? Uh, there's tons of them, this is a list of them. I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, but just to give you an idea of the illogic behind some of these, uh, one of the most common ones is multiple attestation. If several books say it, it must be true. Uh, this is also true of the labors of Hercules, so clearly this criterion doesn't work. Uh, if you have multiple attestation of the labors of Hercules, surely then there was a real Hercules and you really performed miraculous labors. Uh, no, that, that's an illogical argument and it doesn't work for Jesus either. Uh, there's arguments of native language underlay. This attempts to show that certain aspects of the Gospels uh, are translated from Aramaic, and Aramaic was the language spoken in the time and place of Jesus, therefore it must really come from Jesus. Uh, that doesn't work either, uh, because we have the same thing for Mithras. We have Persian texts that underlay uh, later texts in other languages. But just because we have uh, just because we have texts in the original language that Mithras theoretically would have spoken, uh, doesn't mean that there was a historical Mithras. The argument from embarrassment, this is a common one. Uh, who, would write, who would make that up? That's too embarrassing. Uh, well, religions make up embarrassing things all the time. Uh, one of the famous examples of that time was the castration of Atthus. That Atthus is a god who didn't exist. Uh, but the myth of his death, uh, and, and not resurrection, but something sort of quasi-resurrecty about the cult, um, is that he castrated himself. And this, in that particular culture, was one of the most embarrassing and emasculating concepts. It was actually a very loathsome idea to, for a man to cut off his own testicles. Um, so it was a very embarrassing concept, and the priests of Addis, in honor of their god, castrated themselves. Uh, so this, who would make that up? Um, well, evidently someone did. Uh, so the idea that embarrassing things would not be made up is false as well. Uh, another one, a very common one, is the, uh, the criterion of dissimilarity, which just means if there's something novel in the tradition, if there's something new about Christianity, it doesn't look like Judaism or paganism, then it must have come from Jesus. That's illogical because every religion in the universe has novel attributes to it that doesn't tell you anything about the, the reality. For example, Mormonism and Islam both have original novel features to them. That doesn't prove that Mor the angel Moroni or the angel Gabriel exist. So if you want more of this, I go into every single one of these criteria using Bayes' theorem to show the, the logic of them and cite all the scholarship on this, this stuff as well in proving history. So if you want to see the all those things all through the entire criteria list. Uh, and some of those criteria are used by historians in other fields, too, so it's an important point. But let me give you an analogy, and I'll close with this. You know the whole Roswell crashed flying saucer story. And what really happened is a guy found some sticks and tinfoil in the desert. That's the truth. That's what really happened. What was said to have happened, it was debris from an alien spacecraft. What was said to have happened within just 30 years of the event, an entire flying saucer was recovered, complete with alien bodies that were autopsied by the government. So just the 30 years, that's, that, that's a very rapid legendary development. <laughs> the tinfoil on the desert here, of course, would be analogous to the revelations of the archangel named Jesus, and the flying saucer and alien bodies would be analogous to the historical Jesus of Galilee. 
Now imagine if we only had the stories written by the Roswell believers from 30 years later, and information derived from those texts, and nothing else. We had no, uh, none of the skeptical inquirers been burned and destroyed. We have nothing, <laughs> no other information, just what the faith believers have uh, decided to communicate to us. We would not know about the tinfoil. All we would have are multiple witnesses and sources reporting a flying saucer recover, recovery and alien body autopsy. So we've got to think of it in these terms. Neither of those things ever happened. So this is what the way that we would actually, I think, approach Jesus if we didn't have this massive faith tradition uh, to contend with. Now what I've gone through is by no means a proof, uh, but it's enough to show you that the evidence does look sketchy. Uh, and I think that fact would be more obvious to more people if we weren't burdened with religious assumptions and worried about the outrage and backlash of religious believers. And I think there is that kind of tendency to, it's just easier to admit that there is a historical Jesus than to piss off Christians even more than we already do. Uh, <laughs> I get this from scholars a lot, uh, especially. Um, I think that shows that religious belief is, is driving even secular scholarship, unfortunately, because of that. So that's my case. Uh, if we have time, I'll take some questions. Sure. So. Uh, Richard, could you put up really quickly the slide that had the formula on it, you know, for the probability oh, yes. of your hypothesis? You mean, you mean for Bayes' theorem? Yeah, the mathematically yeah. sort of style one. Thank you. You can get this on Wikipedia, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although Wikipedia will confuse you because it will give like a zillion different versions of the equation, and, and so it depends on which one you want to use at a given time. <laughs> Yeah, what's your uh, take on uh, the very small and, and, and infrequent uh, reference in Josephus to Jesus living? Right, yeah. Um, I, I quickly covered that with the one statement where I said that all other evidence is derivative of the Gospels. That would be an example. Even if that were an authentic passage, it would be just Josephus repeating what the Gospels were saying. Uh, so that can't independently corroborate the existence of Jesus. Uh, it's worse than that, though, because the passage is almost certainly an interpolation. Christians rewrote, inserted that paragraph in there. Uh, there's a whole big dispute in the scholarly community as to whether the Christians inserted the whole paragraph or changed a paragraph that was already there and so on. Uh, I come down very clearly and firmly on the side that it was entirely interpolated, and I think the evidence for that is sufficiently strong that there shouldn't be any further dispute on this. Uh, if you're interested in that, I have an article. Um, uh, let me think if I can find that here. Yeah, I wrote an article in a peer-reviewed journal in which I cover all of the evidence uh, regarding the two references to Jesus in Josephus. Uh, that's the second article that you see listed there. Uh, write that down. Uh, if you, you can go to your public library and have them send you a copy of it. Uh, some people are lucky to have a library that allows you online access to journal, electronic journals like uh, JSTOR and things. San Francisco allows this. So, so from my home on the other side of the bay, I can dial in with my library card to San Francisco Library and get this article. Uh, for example. So if you if you look into those resources if you want to try and find these kinds of articles uh, on this. Um, you, okay, you had this um, writing of mythical uh, the uh, characteristics of the myth, the, uh, the born of the virgin, etc. Yes, uh, the rank ragman scale. Yeah. There it is. Now, when you include all the crap stories about people like Alexander or yeah. Julius Caesar, uh, the things that nobody believes about him. That's right. Uh, what do you? What do you? Where, where, they, does somebody, they, where does somebody like that end up on that? Yeah, they all score well below twelve, so they don't even make half. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, there are certain like Sargon, Alexander the Great, and Caesar Augustus are three guys. They had some of these attributes attached to them, and I'm sure there's several of these you could attach to various historical people. But when we when we just restrict our set to those figures that match half or more, what we look when we look in there, we don't see any historical people, and that's peculiar, actually. So if it were if it were a chance thing, if for example, if some people would hit meet these criteria by random chance or meet more than half a random chance, there should be such people in that list, and there aren't. Uh, and so that, that's the peculiar thing, is, is that this is what you get when you look at the scores of half or more. Yeah. My understanding is that uh, uh, there was some story about Alexander being 
there was some tale about Alexander being the son of a god, not to not oh, sure, yeah, 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 and, and, and yeah. like I said, many of those elements got attached to Alexander the Great, but he comes nowhere near to half of them. Yeah. Hi, um, I have absolutely no horse in this race. Well, I don't care whether Jesus was historical or not. Um, I found your presentation uh, very persuasive. I'm not a scholar of any of the ancient languages or the histories or something, so I, you know, I uh, wouldn't be in a position to uh, to argue with you about that. But I, but I am concerned about your appeal to Bayesian theorem, which I find peculiar. Uh -huh. um, Bayesianism is a theory of rational updating. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't give it doesn't give one what one wants, which is a calculus for evaluating the strength of the evidence. It precisely doesn't offer that. Well, what so it does thing, allows wait, you. Wait, wait, I'm yeah. sorry. For one thing, uh, Bayesianism puts no constraint on the assignment of prior probabilities. If you want to give um, probability point nine 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 to the proposition that Jesus existed. Um, you're going to have you're going to have a hard time getting any evidence that's going to bring a basis theorem update uh, to get you down below yeah. the level of belief. That's, that's not Bayes always true. Fine with that. It is that, true. Let me just point it's you to my true. book because my book actually answers well, all these questions in well, detail. So, well, yeah. I'll get out my experts and you can get out yours. But um, and this was peer reviewed by a professor of mathematics as well. Just so you know. Well, did did your professor say that the, that there were any constraints on the distribution of priors? Yeah. Well, that's I actually have a whole chapter discussing how you would constrain that within the context of history. Well, wait, you could constrain it, sure, but sure. the point is that Bayes itself is compatible yeah, yeah. with any so, theory. All Bayes' theorem does is show you what the consequences are of your premises. And well, premises sorry, sorry, it does not do that. It does not do that. It's no, not, no, it's not a point theory. Yeah, it's yeah. important. It's no, not a proof theory. It's no, no, I know, I know. What I'm saying is that what it does is it, the premises are the statements of probability, and then Bayes' theorem tells you what the conclusion would have to be if those premises are assigned. No. And one of those premises is, like, for example, the prior probability. So the question is then, if you're going to put in some arbitrary prior probability, then you have to justify that. Like no, you don't. Look, look, I think to be a no, rational can't. person, hang on, to be a rational person, you want to have good evidence for the things that you think are probably true. Bayes is a complete Bayes' theorem is a completely formal device. It doesn't give you any substantive. Then you need and to read the other thing is, well, yeah, the book covers all of this. I'll, 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 I'll give you some books to read too. Yeah. Yeah. Read Michael Stevens on Bayesian yeah. reasoning. Yeah. The other thing is that the probability of the evidence is always one for Bayes. Is always what? One. Question mark. What's the no, that's not the case. No, that's, that's, that's a stipulation. No, that's not the case. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll ask something less controversial. Uh, Bart Ehrman she didn't strongly get to the disagrees with Mark. Sure. <laughs> um, are you any plans to debate him, and what what is his strongest argument against what you're saying here? Um, I've been waiting for someone to put one up. Uh, I was really hoping for Bart Ehrman's book to be the best case for the other side of this, but uh, it was a terrible book. Um, and if you want to know why I think it's a terrible book, uh, I have written extensively on this. If you Google my name and Bart Ehrman, uh, or you don't have to use Bart Ehrman, you just do Richard Carrier Historicity Recap, for example. My, that blog on that, which is a summary of where he and I, our debate ended on that. Um, he won't debate me further now. I mean, from, from what I understand, I haven't heard this directly from him, but through the grapevine. Uh, supposedly, he said that I'm too mean, and so he doesn't want to debate me anymore, simply because I very harshly criticized his book and caught him out at making some really fundamental errors. But I'd love to debate him if he wanted to, or anybody else who's a secular historian. In fact, I did debate Mark Goodacre on London Radio. Uh, unfortunately, that was London Radio. Uh, but you can get that. There is a, a streaming of it. You can get the uh, the archived version of it online. I blogged about that as well. Uh, so we had kind of an informal debate, he and I, on that radio show. Uh, and I would love to have more formal debates uh, with historians on this as well. Hi. Um, thanks. I know it's my turn. <laughs> I was just telling you, it has to be a question. Is there any way to be concise in a way that's still effective when um, we're in a conversation like with people about the Bible with Jesus? I was thinking, I'm pretty excited to read the book and I'm pretty sure I can make it concise myself, but it'd be mm. kind of awesome if you could do a book that had like really small, awesome points, like singers. <laughs> like, yeah! Maybe. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been paid by my fans to do the really detailed, thorough book first, so uh, right, right. So, the, so that, what you're talking about, might happen in the future, uh, is something I'm considering. I want to do that in history. And is there a way, do you think, like, 
Oh, is there a what? A way to do it. Is there a yeah. way to make something that um, awesome in its content? You know, like it's probably perfect at length. But yeah. it, can we make it smaller so that people won't leave the room by the time sure, yeah. like, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. Anyway. No, it could be done. I've, I've, I've done a 20 minute version of this talk, for example. And I I've done think there's value in that. I think like, yeah, sure. it's pretty exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right, thank you.